Hi everybody, it's uh, Mr. Pedrosa here. It's uh, our first attempt at a l recorded lesson. Um, I figured we would just pick up where we left off. Uh, you last um, worked on chapters one and two of The Great Gatsby. Some of you um, still might want to look at that and turn that in. Um, it was part of your first, I believe, first remote learning assignment. Um, if not, if it wasn't the first remote learning assignment, you can pretty much disregard it. But I'm going to assume that you've read chapters one and two. If not, um, the link to uh, the audiobook is on Google Classroom. You can obviously still go do that just to get caught up. But if you just wanted to pick up with chapter three, you could as well. Um, what I'm going to discuss here is strictly related to chapter three, um, and it'll allow you to answer the questions. Um, I hope um, answer the questions more thoroughly um, after going through and just discussing some of the things that happen in chapter three. Um, we're going to stick to um, a few quotes um, just to kind of guide us through chapter three. Um, but essentially, the chapter surrounds itself around um, this party that um, Gatsby, this mysterious figure that lives next door to Nick Carraway, um, throws. And Nick gets an invitation from his uh, from Gatsby's chauffeur, chauffeur who shows up at his house and hands him the invitation. Um, Nick then goes to this party, um, and as you read through chapter three, and you know. If you need to look for resources online to help you understand this stuff, um, I'll actually post a link to something that um, I've encouraged you to use in the past, and I've always, um, I, I just find it to be a really good site. It's uh, schmoop.com, um, but I'll post a link to that um, if I haven't already in Classroom. Um, so anyways, let's just look at a couple of uh, quotes from Chapter 3, um, and then with this, again, hopefully you should be able to answer the questions that I've posed to you on the Google form. Um, so here we go. Uh, the first quote um, is related to the concept of wealth um, as it is explored in The Great Gatsby. So I'll just read the quote and then just talk a little bit about it. Um, and if you do have any questions on any of this stuff, the place to pose those questions is during our office hour. Um, not our office hour, I'm sorry, our scheduled session in class on, I believe for you guys it's Mondays. Um, just check the time because um, I'm not sure which section I'm sending this to, um, which session you're in. So just um, follow along. So the first quote is related to wealth. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings in the champagne and the stars. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach while his motorboat slid the waters of the sound, drawing aquaplanes over cataracts of foam. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city between nine in the morning, long past midnight, while his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all trains. So... This quote has a lot to unpack in it, but just the, the just the number of things. If you could just point out the number of things um, that typically we may associate with wealth, um, you know, somebody who has gardens may indicate, you know, some sort of social status. Um, champagne, um, diving from the tower of his rafts, indicating that this house is either on the water or has some sort of pool. Um, taking in the sun on the beach, on his beach, that's an indication there that this is a private beach, um, with motorboats, um, aquaplanes, and cataracts. Um, we also get the indication of a Roll, Roll, Rolls Royce. Um, an omnibus is, is a, a, um, a uh, transportation vehicle, so something like a bus, basically. Uh, so if if we're not only talking about a uh, a van or a bus that transports numbers of people, it's a Royal Rolls Royce, which is a pretty much important symbol here of wealth. Um, the ability to throw parties is an indication of wealth, and the fact that these parties go from nine in the morning, long past midnight, and think about the number of food and drink and 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 just things that you'd have to have to entertain people for that long, and this is a regular occurrence. So clearly, um, through this quote, we can get a sense of 
what exactly um, Gatsby offers in terms of uh, a setting for a party and what that setting may tell us about the type of wealth or affluence that Jay Gatsby um, oh, I think I just gave up his uh, first name before I should have done so. Um, but you kind of find that out later in this chapter anyway. Um, next quote. And this is one of my favorite quotes because this is something hidden here that you don't really understand at first glance because it's just not something that we deal with um, in modernity or not with any frequency at least. So here we go. So I'm going to read the quote and then I'll explain the context of the quote. See, he cried triumphantly, it's a bona fide piece of printed matter. It fooled me. This fella's a regular Belasco. It's a triumph. What thoroughness, what realism. Knew when to stop too. Didn't cut the pages. But what would you want? What do you expect? Okay, so that's from, again, from chapter three. Um, the little numbers here at the ends, I've Probably should have mentioned this in the first quote. Um, are the paragraphs in which you can find um, the quote? Um, so in this case, chapter three, it's in paragraph forty-one through forty-nine of that chapter. So let me go back to the quote, and again, we we have kind of two t two themes. I I picked this quote because it kind of trans um, transpires across two different types of of topics. So we have still the 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 concept of wealth. And then the concept of lies and deceit um, that don't necessarily go together. It's just this quote kind of just encompasses things that we can talk about regarding those two concepts and as they pertain to the great Gatsby. So in terms of wealth, um, so we're talking about the, this is the, the scene where the owl eyed man is in the library and Nick and Jordan encounter him there. And just they kind of get into a little bit of a discussion about this the setting this library in gatsby's uh mansion so you have uh the owl eyed man who's kind of like being nosy you know he's in this guy's mansion and he happens to wander into this room as do jordan and nick um on their search for gatsby for for the for the host um uh, and they come across and, and run into each other and the conversation uh surrounds itself around these books um that the owl eyed man is very impressed by he's he's completely um just thoroughly impressed and, and, and he like, has almost as a justification like he's, he's like see he's like i knew this guy i knew this is real like this whole setup this mansion this party these people these are all real things it's not some show that's being put on so the owl eyed man buys into this buys into the idea of gatsby as a thorough just somebody who uh who who actually has these things? It's not some story in the in the newspapers or just conversations as you hear throughout the the party. This is an actual setting. It's a it's a real life um, occurrence for this owl eyed man. Just to just to be clear, real life in terms of the book, right? In the universe of the book, it's it's maybe um, uh, representing real life events, but it is a fictional piece. Just to make sure that was clear. So the owl eyed man. Um, is impressed by Gatsby's uh, thoroughness in his presentation as a wealthy person. Um, but the interesting thing to me, um, and it kind of blends into where the lies and deceit meets the wealth quote, meets the wealth as concepts. The lies and deceit, well, it's not a lie and deceit that he has these books, but the fact that the pages aren't cut. And that's what I was referring to before uh, when I was talking about something that may not be as uh, clear in our modern contemporary context. So when we go to a store to buy books, which in itself is something that is increasingly um, being done less and less, maybe, I don't know, but just the, the idea that we can buy books through a screen and just read them on a screen uh, is different, right? It's, not, it's something that's kind of, it's a, it's a shift in how we uh, read. But back in the day, you know, the, the day of the 1920s, 30s, and, and honestly, this went a lot further because I have books that are like this. Um, and if we were in class, I would show you this because uh, I think I have one right in the back of the room that I usually pull out every year that has very clear, um, is a clear example of this. So back in the day when you'd buy a book, you would notice that, you know, the, the binding of, of the book has like the, what appears to be like sections kind of glued together. Well, that section would be complete on the other end. So when you'd buy a book, you'd have to physically with a knife cut the pages so that you could actually open the book or else it would be sealed shut. So this tells us a couple of things in terms of Gatsby because these are his books, right? So he has these books because, I don't know, he's definitely trying to, 
show off that he has these books um because his, his mahogany library is his old wood clearly there's been a lot of thought and money put into creating this library so he made sure that he had these books to impress people you know typically how people do with bookshelves you know I, I think people are doing that a lot right now especially with these videos that you see on like youtube and stuff of like these late night hosts or just people talking they're generally behind or in front of a bookshelf it, it, it kind of indicates a little bit of of um you know knowledge we have knowledge because we have these books sort of a thing i read all these books it may not be the case but it, it's something that we're led to believe like you have the books theoretically you could read them and you have read them um but in this case in gatsby's case he can't possibly have read them because they haven't even been cut yet so there are books that have been specifically purchased to put on this bookshelf on these bookshelves just to look like he has read them like he is a a cultured intelligent um uh bookish fellow so that kind of blends into both right it demonstrates his wealth by creating this library having the ability to buy all these books that haven't even been touched and it touches on the lies and deceit that he's creating this idea that he is this cultured um uh person who reads a lot and just knows things through that reading um so i hope that that quote makes sense if you have questions on any of this stuff please um come see me during our time and and uh ask them Pose them. I'm sure if you have questions, other people will as well. The last quote is uh, continuing on the lies and deceit uh, concept, and I'll just read it as, as, as you see it on the screen. It made no difference to me. Dishonesty in a woman is a thing you never blame deeply. I was casually sorry, and then I forgot. It was on that same house party that we had a curious conversation about driving a car. It started because she passed so close to some workmen that our fender flicked a button on one man's coat. So the interesting thing to me, um, and to a lot of people, because this is a quote that is typically picked up on, picked up on to talk about um, gender roles and and just how you know the perception of 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 how of uh, the difference between men and women. And Nick here, our narrator, tells us something very interesting about how he. Um, just kind of generally talks about women. And again, this is an indictment on the time period. It's, it's a way to look into how people interacted with each other, how we saw each other um, as Americans, as human beings in the 1920s. Um, in particular, social context, we're talking about, um, you know, a more affluent, wealthy, um, aspiring wealthy um, part of, of New York City in the 1920s. Uh, but it still tells us a lot about how women were viewed. And, and honestly, the, res the relationship between men and women, not just women, how men viewed women, that's also very interesting. Um, extremely interesting to me, at least. Um, so he says here, it made no difference to him. Dishonesty in a woman is a thing you can never blame deeply. In other words, it's okay for women to lie, according to Nick, because, you know, they that's just how they are. And that's that's that's, I hope, not how we view things nowadays, that we increasingly look at things with more equality and and not generalize entire swaths of people based off of you know inter individual interactions with specific human beings um but that's a very that's a crazy comment to make um that just a blanket statement about a whole gender about half basically more than half of people that this whole group of people um it's fine if they 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 lie because, you know, what else? you can't really expect much more from him. That's really kind of what he's saying here. You can't really blame them for it. He was casually sorry. So, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's, you tell me what that's trying to say um, and what implications that may have going, you know, in other realms of society. If, if, you, if you kind of, you know, take in that women are dishonest, do you think they're going to have, you know, the same type of jobs as men, the same type of power as men, the same type of wealth as men. There are implications that come along with that, um, that type of mentality. And Nick, who appears to be a pretty sympathetic character, does show us a bit of his misogyny about, you know, how he views women as inferior, right? You can't trust them, right? Because it's just something you can't blame them on, according to what he's saying here. So, Think about that and how that plays into how we have um, our views on gender roles and the way that we, we view men and women, um, how that's been, I would say, 
upgraded um, greatly, if, if we're not entirely there in terms of equality. I, I hope we're getting there. Um, but this gives us a little window into how this gender was viewed, at least through the eyes of F. Scott Fitzgerald, who was an influential writer in American history. So this also gives us that, um, you know, that, that, that connection with the social sphere of the time. Uh, and we know, I mean, we're talking about a time period in which women had just, were just a 1920 is when women gained the right to vote. So we're creeping on 100 years now. And this quote kind of blends really well in with that, that idea of where we were at, at that point. Uh, so we were just kind of breaking that glass ceiling in 19, in 1920. And over time, um, I think we're getting closer, but it's definitely not equal in terms of, at least in terms of things like CEO pay and stuff like that, um, corporate pay, um, pay scales, and you see some disparities there between men and women. Um, but I don't know. That was our first uh, go through here with this um, quote deck. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and we will check in again at some point. Take care.